Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our special on the Literatur Festival Berlin 2020. My name is Volker Wiebrecht. I normally work for public radio and TV. Um, let me start with the inconvenient part. I mean, it's funny enough that we are almost like 100, 200, 300 people that I have to explain you. If, if you're sitting on the very top, please don't rush down once the show is over. Just keep the distance, enjoy yourself a little bit longer. I mean, it's my first time to be in public for, let's say, six, seven months. May I ask you who is out for the first time on a cultural event today? One, two, three. So this is where the happy are, right? Isn't it amazing? I mean, it's a little bit limited, but uh, you see the mind is not, and we're going to share what's inside our mind. So thank you very much for coming. Welcome. Yeah. That works. <laughs> As you might have noticed, tonight's uh, language is English, just in case you're wondering what kind of language I'm speaking. Um, almost an answer to the question why we are here is your presence. You see that nobody is in the island, we all are connected, and whatever we do has a strong connection to each other. We are all deeply woven in, and you find out that the people talking tonight are indispensable threads here. So we join their ideas and we join their texts. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight's keynote speaker, I don't have to introduce them in the long term, so I'm just going to call them to stage. Please welcome tonight Mario Vargas Llosa. <laughs> Sharon Oduo Otu. Bankaj Mishra, Nora Bosong, Daniel Kielman. And first of all, I want to welcome the man who made it ever all possible that we come together. He is the founder and director of the International Literature Festival Berlin. Welcome Ulrich Schreiber. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. I'm very glad uh, to speak here. Some short words. Um, I have, first of all, I have uh, to say thank you for the authors, especially uh, these authors who came not from Berlin. I think one, two, three we have from Berlin here. But Mario, you came from Madrid, and Pankaj, you from London. Thank you a lot for coming to Berlin and make this possible. Thank you a lot. Um, I have also, I want also to thank. Um, Esra Kütschik from the Allianz Kultur Stiftung and um, Kai-Uwe Peter from the Berliner Sparkasse. They, make, they made it possible in terms of financial uh, conditions of this uh, event. And uh, yeah, generally, I have to thank Ignacio Olmos, who, speak, who will speak after me. Uh, we had, I think, six months before we had this, this idea uh, to tell the truth, he had the idea to realize this uh, conversation and this uh, event, um, but on the Pariser Platz. This was the first idea. This not, not happened, and also not with Angela Merkel. This was also the first idea. And, um, but um, anyway, uh, it was possible to, to uh, arrange this, uh, this event here in the Kammermusiksaal. We are very glad, and um, I have to thank uh, Ignacio a lot. So I think uh, I give the word to Ignacio or to you, Volker, at first. Right, just thank keep you. going. Okay. All right. Yeah, now that you have the word, I'm just going to call you again on stage. Well, thank you for inviting us and for the splendid idea. Ladies and gentlemen, Ignacio Olmos, director of the Instituto Cervantes Berlin. Good evening and welcome. Thank you very much. Welcome to this event, which is co-organized by the International Literature Festival Berlin and the Instituto Cervantes. We are extremely delighted to welcome tonight a gr group of great writers from diverse backgrounds and languages to discuss the role of culture in post-corona societies. The current pandemic is dramatically exacerbating two main problems that seriously threaten culture nowadays the global rise of nationalism and the darker aspects of digitization, both of which are now boosted by the coronavirus. 
Nationalism is the most facile and effective of political tools, as well as the most dangerous. As Vargas Llosa wrote, and I quote, nationalism is the cause of the worst historical catastrophes, and it's deeply racist. Nationalism has been steadily rising in the midst of a pandemic that has revealed a world incapable of a coordinated, united response. The Brookings Institution in Washington speaks of the end of the world order and defines America's, repu America's reputation as a dysfunctional power and China's growth as a coercive power. Thus, one can say with a certainty that the nationalism of Trump's America sees China and Putin's Russia is not the answer. The dismantling of the rule of law and political freedoms, according to a recent Bertelsmann study, are increasingly shaking up once stable democracies. Many governments are act actively promoting the weakening of democracy and the strengthening of repression systems, specifically against the free press, in favor of a new reinvigorated nationalism. Cultural diver diversity is seen as a threat and culture in itself as an elitist sin. The virus and the following economic collapse have only redoubled the urgency of these reflections. What's more, the actual push towards the digital seems definitive. Although digitization has many positive aspects, such as people, such as people interconnectedness and access to a wide pool of information in real time, the risks are becoming increasingly clear. Surveillance of citizens, spread of fake news, and the reduction of cultural life to, the, to mere entertainment. Cultural products are just consumed from the greater comfort and pragmatism offered by the large platforms. Naomi Klein called it the Screen New Deal and described our past months of physical isolation, and I quote, not as a painful necessity to save lives, but as a living laboratory for a permanent and highly profitable no-touch future. I will go, our goal tonight is not just to establish the importance of culture, but to explore the possibilities from within culture to resist and counterfeit these dramatic developments. One could argue that culture is indeed the spinal column of democratic societies and the very safeguard of democratic freedom worldwide. Culture is the last frontier. Thank you very much and enjoy this wonderful evening. Thank you, Mr. Olmos. Last greetings words, uh, they both come uh, as a couple on stage. Uh, there's first Ezra Kutsche from Allianz Kulturstiftung. She's chairman of Board of Trustees. And she shows up together with Kai-Uwe Peter, CEO Berliner Spargasse and chairman Stiftung Brandenburger Tor. Welcome you both, wherever you are. Up there. Your applause is coming too. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, to the first international literature festival since the pandemic. As Pankaj Mishra told me today, that's the first one since the pandemic. Yeah, organizing a public event in these times of global pandemic is a challenge in itself. That is why we, Kai Uwe Peter and I, would like to thank all the authors present here tonight, and of course, the festival, Ulrich Schreiber and his team for putting this event together in such a difficult moment and such difficult circumstances. The pandemic has made us realize how important it is to come together and to rely on each other. 
We live in a time of profound social and political upheaval. The current crisis has not made existing inequalities disappear. Instead, I would say it has made them loom larger as under a magnifying glass, as the burning camp of Moria shows us painfully today. The pandemic has brutally exposed our vulnerabilities vulnerabilities many of us refuse to see, but which writers have always known about. This is what I would say the power of literature, to reflect the human condition through and beyond individual experiences and to imagine how the world might be different. For what the role of an artist perhaps relies on, Olga Tokarczuk said so well in her Nobel lecture, is, and now I quote, giving a foretaste of something that could exist and thus causing it to become imaginable. And being imagined is the first stage of existence. Thank you very much. Maybe a small applause for the hygienic deputy here as well. She's going to work very hard tonight. <laughs> All set. Mm. Thank you, dear Ezra. Let us think tonight also of all those authors that would like to be here but cannot. That cannot be here because they are not allowed to leave their country because they are imprisoned, because they have to take refuge, or those that cannot be with us because they have been killed. Allow me, please, to rely on my fellow Swabian, a medic, a philosopher, an historian, a playwright, a poet, and once a refugee himself. Art, he said, art is a daughter of freedom. Die Kunst ist eine Tochter der Freiheit. Dankeschön. Thank you very much. You are quit with wiping, so I can make the introduction short. So thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, since we have to get out here at uh, 8.30 sharp, uh, I allow myself to have the pleasure to feel like David Letterman. My next guests do not need further introductions, so I'm just going to give you a really short introduction. By, here with us is Mario Vargas Llosa. Tonight, Spanish, Peruvian politician, author, journalist, winner of the Nobel Prize Literature in 2010. I see him as a passionate defender of democracy, beyond any questions of left and right, and this over decades now. I don't know what you have done for us, but I know it was a lot, that's for sure. And there is also, I read, an asteroid named after you. So um, you're shining light to all of us. Depending on your orbit, now you're very close. Mario Vargas Llosa, welcome. <laughs> A plea for art and culture. Art and culture are by no means superfluous when we face difficult times. Culture provides us with weapons with which to rebel against the difficulties of life and make us indomitable citizens who cannot be easily manipulated by the powers of this world always ready to invade the spaces where they meet no resistance. Culture is, in and of itself, a protest against the inadequacies of life, a way of facing up the miseries of this world and trying to overcome them. Thinking, creating, inventing stories was surely, in more primitive times, the way in which human beings 
could cope with the limitations of a war pregnant with dangers. The fear of thunder and lightning, of ferocious animals lurking in the forest, of snakes, bats, and many types of poisonous beasts. Fantasy helped humans overcome those limitations and then set some models that thanks to cultural and scientific progress, we gradually reach and surpass. Culture was the engine of those transformations that made us think at one point that we had mastered nature and put it at our service once and for all. Pandemics such as the new coronavirus show us that this was not true and that nature still hides many dangers that haunt human civilization and can cause devastating damage around the globe. Probably one of the most positive consequences of this grueling experience will be that our societies will show themselves to be more willing to invest in scientific research and improve our health systems, and that they will be less complacent than they have been for so many years in the face of the risks that nature still hides. The fight against the new coronavirus should in no way stop or slow our efforts to expand freedom, especially in the countries where it has regressed, nor should the pandemic be a pretext to reduce individual freedom to a bare minimum on, in the name of preserving health. The fight for freedom and the preservation of life and health go hand in hand. It is a shame that in our times there are still societies such as Russia where opponents of the regime can be shot in the streets or poisoned by the government itself with no apparent consequences for those involved. And it is no less shameful that in the heart of Europe there continue to be regimes as barbarous and primitive as that of Belarus, where they still falsify electoral results against their citizens, will to install political and legal frameworks that guarantee freedom and all its manifestations and forms. Appealing for freedom in Europe is by no means to claim a privilege. The same freedom is also needed in Latin America, where Cuba and Venezuela and Nicaragua have cruelly subjected millions of people to systems of terror. In Africa, where many dictatorships still hide under anti-colonial pretexts. In Asia, where there are authoritarian regimes that pretend to be a model for other regions, and even in the United States itself, until yesterday, a beacon of freedom, but today a country that sets out an ugly example to the world with the way in which the current White House seeks to erode the institutions that are the very foundation of democracy. It is a good thing that in these difficult times, Berlin is able to host a literary festival and important cultural initiatives such as the one that brings us together today. Literature is not an ornament or mere entertainment, as it's sometimes believed in democratic countries. That is not true. Literature is a combat weapon that mobilizes us and encourages us to act against the deficiencies that we see around us. In this, there is a line of continuity between us and our ancient ancestors. First, we dream, and then we try to make our dreams come true. The first of which is to achieve freedom, a free and fair world with opportunities for all in which the right of citizens to live in peace is respected and protected by the rule of law and a system of justice worthy of such a name. This is our plea in these difficult times in which art and culture 
more than anything else, can help us confront the new coronavirus and all the other pests that threaten us. Thank you. So you would say the first and noble duty or possibility of culture and literature is to protect us from the wilderness from the outside and the inside. Is that like the main thesis of what you're saying? I think culture defends us uh, against all, all the enemies, uh, particularly against dictatorships. Okay, so, well, probably they don't read. I just heard that Trump has never read a decent book. Well, that was the correspondent was telling me. Going back a couple of months, I've been told, well, take your time. Now we are facing the lockdown. Read some decent books. And so literature was more recommended like a tranquilizer almost in a certain way. Calm down, use that for that purpose. Um, let me ask you the other way around. How did you experience the last month? You've been reading newspapers. How and will, where... Will you repeat your, your question? Yeah. How and where did you experience your last month? Were they paralyzed? Were you been threatened? I was saying that um, as a Peruvian, as a Latin American, uh, I am a, an expert in, in dictatorships. Uh, I was born under a dictatorship, and probably during my whole life, there's been more dictators than democracies in my country. So I can, I can talk about dictatorships by experience, you know. Um, I know what is a dictator, uh, dictators from the right, and also one dictator from the left. The General Velasco was very leftist and um, he nationalized the, the, the main industries. Um, but at the, at, at the end, both dictatorships, the right and, 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 and left dictatorships were very similar and they destroyed freedom and they created uh, a kind of um, society in which uh, uh, lies uh, were prevailing about uh, truths, um, uh, uh, the strong censorship of, 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 the, of the press and of books and on, on, on TV and uh, radio, created an atmosphere in which uh, uh, we believe everything and we didn't b believe everything. Mm -hmm. We were totally confused about the, the real world, and this, uh, this is probably the worst aspect of a dictatorship, in which you don't know uh, what is going on, and so you use your imagination to try to uh, understand what, what the world is uh, going on, uh, uh, and this confusion, you know, is this uh, is deeply uh, af affected uh, for the whole of society, but with the exception of the uh, center of power, which are military and uh, uh, in, 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 in general, you know, uh, people who are taking advantage of this, uh, of this situation. Mm -hmm. no? And you in person, how have you been the last four months? Productive or remote? It? Sorry, will you repeat that? Yeah, well, the acoustic here is really, okay. How have you been and where the last four months? Have you been working or just observing? Was that the productive time I for you? I am always working. I, <laughs> I, I am al always, always working uh, uh, first as a jour journalist and then writing. Yeah? And uh, I, I always, always, always write. All, all my, my, my life is concentrated in, um, in my, my job. Uh, my job includes great pleasures, as is reading, um, and less, less pleasures, which is writing, you know? It's, it's difficult, but very difficult. But I couldn't live without writing, you know? So I say it. It also comes to wildness. Thank you so far. We're going to talk a little bit later. Thank you. Well, it's not easy to describe someone who is uh, inventing a me who refuses to be tagged. 
as a role model. Try to find somebody who cannot be tagged. I'll try anyway. Sharon Dodua Otu was brought up and educated in London and now lives in Berlin. Her parents are from Ghana. Her latest prize was the Ingeborg Bachmann Prize. She's always tagged as an activist, but I prefer her self-description. Let's see whether it's accurate and actual. Black British mother, activist, author, and editor, period. That's, okay, substantial. And as Bachmann jury stated, she has a keen eye for latent racism. I assume she did not develop that, but she wanted, because she wanted, because, because she had to, right? All right, let's see what your thoughts are going for. Thank you. May I just give you that microphone because I stole yours. Is it actually possible to speak from there? You can also speak from there. Make use of the room, yes. I'll speak from here because I've got these really uncomfortable shoes on. Yeah. <laughs> I, I see. Yes, so it's good, I'll sit down. Okay, for those who have been in crisis, back in March 2015, when Brexit had not yet happened, and when Trump had not yet been elected, and the far-right AFD had not yet become the third largest party in the German Bundestag, those at the edges of society had already seen the signs of things to come. The Nobel Prize-winning novelist Toni Morrison wrote an essay entitled No Place for Self-Pity, No Room for Fear. It was a rallying call to culture makers. In times of dread, she stated, artists must never choose to remain silent. Five years later, I am compelled to think about her words, for certainly these are times of dread. But I'm also wondering, do these times ever go away? Or would it be more accurate to say that they've been circling around us over and over again, sometimes far enough away that we might forget their presence, and at other times, brushing against us with their wings. <clears throat> in March 2020, Germany went into lockdown. The severe restrictions on public life introduced by the German government due to the outbreak of COVID-19 overwhelmed almost everyone, including many individuals who up until that point had not experienced any existential limits to their freedom of movement, civil rights, or bodily autonomy. Suddenly, they were confronted with severely restricted access to healthcare, childcare, public transport, social networks, and family support. Suddenly, they were losing their paid work or struggling to juggle home office with homeschooling. Suddenly, they were in new territory, desperately wondering how they would survive. For those who have been in crisis, none of this felt new. Black and African diasporic communities have been watching the ocean swallow the bodies of our mothers, fathers, and parents, our brothers, sisters, and siblings, our children, our ancestors. We have been watching our families being brutalized, at times even murdered, by those who have been charged to protect us. And even those who are not law enforcement officers have questioned our right to walk the streets of our own home cities. Where do you come from? Your German is so good. Well, if you don't like it here, you can always leave. Like those canaries in 19th century British coal mines, black people have been inhaling the toxic fumes of racism, and we have watched the less affected, sorry, and we have warned the less affected over and over, long before they proudly used the hashtag Black Lives Matter on Twitter or posted black squares on Instagram. But even in the midst of this outpouring of newfound awareness, black people were still fighting to defend their humanity. At the height of summer, images of the murder of George Floyd were replayed again and again to the tune of, we must raise awareness, all the while re-traumatizing those who legitimately fear that they could be next. I agree that we must raise awareness, but my question is, why did they not already know? For those who were paying attention, there was no surprise. The populist parties of today did not suddenly emerge from nowhere. Their paths were paved by the good people of, I'm not racist, but, and their neighbors from the town of, I don't see color. 
In this climate, I have wondered how much sense it makes for any of us to focus on culture at all. What use is a writer in a country where the sole answer to a gun attack on a synagogue is to hire more police officers? Where only after massive protest, authorities in Berlin concede that a monument to honor the Sinti and Roma murder victims of National Socialism will not be dismantled to make way for the extension of an urban railway line. Where even after massive protest, authorities in Bremen refused to close the mass accommodation in Lindenstrasse, causing 200 refugees to become infected with COVID-19. Why do we require Arabic and Turkish speaking children to sever their mother tongues while hate speech is given pride of place on talk shows and cabarets? None of this has anything to do with democracy. As a writer, I feel powerless to protect synagogues, and I cannot single-handedly abolish inhumane refugee camps, but I can bear witness. I can use my literature in the service of black lives. I have been asked why I do this. I have been warned not to do this. But as the multiple award-winning Nigerian novelist Chinua Achebe once said, those who tell you do not put too much politics in your art are not being honest. If you look very carefully, you will see that they are the same people who are quite happy with the situation as it is. What they are saying is, don't upset the system. For marginalized people, the system desperately needs to be upset. For those who have been in crisis, writers like Toni Morrison, and Chinua Achebe have shown us how to transform our collective pain, reimagining our humanity, and hand it back to us as art. And no matter who tries to steal it, no matter whose mouth appropriates it, no matter which museum proudly calls it its own, our art will always belong to us. Thank you very much. Can you describe why I'm touched, or is that the, let's say, the intention? Because there's a very touching, subtle tone in your text um, that is trying to overcome, I think, classic role models of uh, victims and um, those who are doing the deeds. But what is your role as a writer? Are you a fighter, or are you a writer? I think I am definitely a fighter, not because, as you said, not really because I want to be. I'm not, I'm not interested in fighting as such but it's impossible to be neutral, in my opinion. So therefore, if I see injustice, I have to position myself. And either what I'm doing is in service of the status quo, or it's saying I want to change the status quo. That's what I do. What's the, what's the strong, yeah. I didn't want to interrupt any applause here. Please keep going at that time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So. Um, what's the better weapon, English or German? Because we struggle to... Uh, what Good would you say? question. Yeah. You know that? Uh, when, would you, when would you use... Because you're perfect in both languages. Thank you, but it's not I'm not really perfect in German, but I do try. Um, you know, I'm going to answer German for this reason. <clears throat> I'm reading a book by the author um, Max Cholek. His latest book is called Gegenwärtsbewältigung, which I have no idea how to translate into English but it's something to do with the times that we are in and the challenges we have in facing up to history and what can we do. And in the book, Max talks a lot about uh, our responsibilities as uh, artists and writers also. And he also talks about the part I'm at is where we're looking at the German language and what it's done in the past, what the German language has been do used, what atrocities have been committed in the language of German. And I'm saying, let's reclaim that language and do some really <laughs> powerful stuff with it. All right, thank you. We keep talking. Thank you very much. Pankaj Mishra is born in northern India, publishes his essay in major newspapers all over the planet, considered as a brilliant analyst. One of his last most celebrated books shows how deep-rooted are wrath and anger in our modern world, Age of Anger, History of the Present. Let's see, you don't look angry, but you look convincing. Welcome, Pankaj Mishra. Yeah. 
Thank you very much. Um, unlike uh, Mario Vargas Llosa, I was uh, actually born in a democracy. And I would say that for most of my life, I've specialized in democracy, the world's largest democracy, in fact, India. But I fear that I might spend the rest of my life specializing in dictatorship, given the situation that exists in India today, where, um, especially during the pandemic, the crackdown on writers, intellectuals, academics has intensified. Many of the people I know personally are in prison. Others live in fear of prison. There are writers who have been assassinated. People have even been arrested for writing the wrong kind of Facebook post. So when we talk about China and Russia, these countries have never really made any great claims to being democracies with rule of law. Uh, India has. And if I speak from that background, and if I inject a tone of skepticism, uh, which Sharon has already injected into the discussion of democracy and culture, what do they really mean in this context? It is because I come to this subject, I'm forced to come to this subject with a certain prejudice, with a certain bias. And it's interesting, I often find this prejudice, this particular perspective, among Eastern European and Russian writers of the past who came to the West, who came to Western Europe and America, and found themselves in a very peculiar relationship with society, with other writers in the West. Um, I'm thinking in particular of Czeslaw Milos. Uh, there's a wonderful book of his, I'm sure you uh, know of it or have read it, called The Captive Mind About Life in a Communist Society. And another very great Polish writer, Witold Gombrowicz, once wrote a brilliant review of that book, uh, basically saying that people like him, writers from Poland or writers from Eastern Europe, felt a bitter powerlessness when face to face with writers from Western Europe and America. And I have to say, I've come to feel the same uh, living in London part of the year and participating in Anglo-American intellectual and literary culture, where it seems to me uh, too many complacent assumptions are made about the role of writers, um, their role in advancing democracy, their role as promoters of free speech. I mean, America, Germany, I think, is quite different in this regard from England and America. But in these two countries, both great imperialist powers, um, it has become too easy for writers to claim a high moral ground and to then tell other people where they're going wrong. I felt for some time that we need to question this uh, exalted moral status that many writers occupy in Britain and the United States in the English-speaking world. I think it's time to emphasize the more complicated relationship that exists between writers and structures of power in their societies. I actually became more interested in this question when, if you remember Mo Yan, when he won the, the, the Chinese novelist who won the Nobel Prize a few years ago. And uh, immediately afterwards, he came under sustained attack from some very famous writers in living in America and New York, and their charge was that Mo Yan has never directly challenged the Communist Party of China. Um, the assumption was that good literature can really not be produced under conditions of censorship of the kind that exists in China, and that democracy and free speech are crucial to intellectual and creative life. Well, in one sense, absolutely yes. But I think we should remember that some of the greatest works of literature were produced under certainly not democracy or uh, rule of law, but they were produced under extreme political repressiveness. The whole of 19th century Russian literature is witness to this. Let's also not forget that societies with much greater political freedoms in Western Europe and the United States, writers themselves took extremely conservative, often very reactionary positions. Um, 
Dickens comes to mind, a supporter of um, colon colonialism in, in India. Um, Flaubert had his dodgy moments. Um, there are any number of writers, uh, list is actually very long, who flirted with ideologies such as extreme nationalism, Stalinism, anti-Semitism. Uh, William Faulkner, a great writer, said he would resort to violence if desegregation was imposed on the American South. And there are, there are many, many examples of that. Um, so what the attacks on Moyan brought home was why a writer living under a repressive authoritarian regime should be expected to do all the hard work of challenging the political regime in his, in his country, and why writers who actually enjoy freedom of speech, rule of law, democracy, everything in their respective countries should choose to amplify some of the crudest arguments about non-Western peoples, about non-Western societies, whether it comes to invading Afghanistan or invading Iraq or fueling Islamophobia or promoting general distrust of Muslims and Islams while remaining completely detached with the question of social justice for African Americans or other minorities in many of these countries. So for someone coming from a place like India where writers are, have been under really very serious attack from anti-democratic forces, it has been very depressing to watch how many esteemed writers and intellectuals have chosen to essentially amplify the prejudices, the orthodoxies of political elites, military elites, at a safe remove from the actual consequences of these policies and these ideas, which are essentially, which is the wholesale destruction of human lives. It's also very difficult for me not to see living in the West, at least part of the year after 9-11, how many writers joined in, in an assertion of civilizational identity, this, this, this conversation, this discourse about uh, Western values, the enlightenment, and often that, that discourse feeding into this notion that there are these people out there who are very irrational, who are backward, who have not been enlightened, who need to be enlightened. So what I'm, what I'm trying to argue is that this relationship between power, writers, culture is not as straightforward as it might seem. The fact remains, whether you're Moyan or a Chinese writer in China writing today, or whether you are a writer enjoying formal freedoms of speech and democracy, the writers tend to avoid direct confrontation with powerful institutions and individuals largely because they have to stay at home and work. They have to produce, they have to write. Um, you can't always be, you can fight, you can be an activist, but you can't always do that. So some degree of detachment from the world, some degree of indifference to the world is always been necessary. And especially I think in the, the imperialist powers where I think if you knew what underpin the power and wealth of those societies as a writer, you would find it very difficult to write about certain, certain subjects. I mean, you know, if Jane Austen knew that the world she was writing about was underpinned by the wealth of slavery in the Caribbean, she would have been a very different writer if she found it very difficult to write the books she did. Now, this little bubble, uh, which, you know, every writer in some sense inhabits of relative security, stability, uh, and it was especially strong in, in, in the sort of great winners of history in Britain and the United States. This little bubble has begun to crack. It has actually really been kind of disintegrating uh, in the last uh, decade or so. Uh, there are many reasons. There are, you know, uh, there are actual, the pressure of events like 9-11, the financial crisis, Brexit, Trump, and now the pandemic. All this is kind of breaking this little bubble. There is also the fact that there are people from elsewhere with other backgrounds, other perspectives, other experiences 
who have so far been kept at a great remove from metropolitan life, from uh, uh, intellectual and literary life in London and New York, they are now coming forward and telling their stories and they're narrating their experiences and that has also complicated some of these big mainstream narratives. And I think all of us are now forced in some ways to examine the relationship that exists between what we do, our work, and the disconnection that exists between ourselves, our work, and this very deeply interconnected world of injustice, desperate conflicts, violence, dispossession. I mean, you know, I have to say this education, which is coming very late to many people in different uh, parts of the so-called developed world, as Sharon pointed out, has never really been strictly necessary in many of the less fortunate societies of the world. In some of these nations that are still in the making or doomed to failure and decay, many writers have been for a long time completely exposed to violence, different kinds of violence, state against its citizens, one ethnic or religious group against another, uh, private actors, non-state actors. For these writers, instability is something simply assumed. So even the best place of them cannot really believe in the assumption that security and stability is a given. So the writer of the situation, let me conclude, has changing, is changing very, very dramatically. And I feel it calls for a different kind of engagement with the world. And one reason why I feel reluctant to prescribe what exactly that engagement should be, uh, all I can say is that I'm speaking from one particular experience and that if I know anything about culture, it is fundamentally an act of criticism. It's an act of self-criticism. And I think this uh, idea of breaking established patterns of thought and feeling, that is what really culture equips us to do, that is what it is capable for, and that is what we must continue to do in order to forge a more honest relationship with our respective societies and their structures of power. Thank you. Thank you. Well, all right. Well, you made a lot of distinctions. Let me just try to nail you in 30 seconds, okay? With that given thought you just had there. What's your relationship as a writer to your own government, like the extreme Hindu government that is very traditional, that is suppressing some parts of the population, at the same time claiming we are a democracy, at the same time suffering? So, in two sentences, if possible. Well, I can tell you um, it's that uh, if I open my email, just now, with the spam account open, I will find at least 15 emails from sources sponsored by the government that are either attacking me, abusing me, threatening my, 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 my family, or sending me pornographic emails, or attaching my email to pornograph pornographic websites. So the attack on writers in these situations is relentless, is, is continuous, so that is the relationship right now, not just myself, but many writers actually have with a supposedly democratic government. I mean, that's the other complicated thing. This is not an authoritarian government. This is a government democratically elected by a great majority. And all this em enjoys a great deal of support among the masses. So this is why I think we must complicate our notions of democracy at this point. Large numbers of people are actually supporting these acts of violence, repression, and censorship. Is there any protection? I mean, is the value of uh, human rights, your birthright, your life right, is that protected in your country, in your case? To be very honest, I think the greatest protection right now I have is that I'm in Germany, that I'm not in India, that I'm living outside, um, and I'm not sure when I'll be able to return because things have gotten from bad to worse during the, during the pandemic. This is a situation well, I'm just, I'm just about to invite you to stay a little longer. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much so far. We could talk a little. It's not getting... Yes, thank you. Thank you.
While it's not getting less with grants and awards, Nora Bassong, German author, born in Bremen, will talk to us. She's also a popular interview partner, I found out. Yeah, Deutschland Radio is like a constant customer, always. they always ring at your door. Um, be it uh, to the subject Corona demos or European solidarity or especially the lack of solidarity, which is almost at hand. And being asked by the Süddeutsche Zeitung, Zeitung to picture someone who is the opposite of herself. She had taken a photo while she's looking in a little mirror. You remember that? That is the perfect dialectics in one person, thesis and antithesis. Let's see where that leads. Nora Bossong. So, um, my speech is quite short. We're speaking here tonight to plea for culture and democracy, assuming that there might be a connex between the two. Not only in the sense that democratic societies allow a vivid, pluralistic, cultural life, but also that culture itself does anything good for the idea of democracy. As a citizen, I will always beg you not to underestimate the fragility of liberal democratic societies and to support them as much as you can. As a political columnist, I will raise my voice to remind politicians to act resolutely against authoritarian disregard of international law, but also to act against our disregard of human rights, like we see that, for example, in the refugee camp of Moira, which, um, well, actually I have to say it was not a question if it would happen, but um, when. And we all knew that. And if you didn't know, then you could have known. But maybe we were sitting in a nice hall like this, listening to chamber music, and didn't think too much about it. But uh, as a writer of novels and poetry, I have my doubts if culture should be taken as a vehicle for any political goal because it usually went terribly wrong whenever culture aimed to educate ideologically or if only one moral attitude was wanted. Let me pose a quite simple but scurrilous question. Did culture ever prevent the darkest excesses of mankind as murder and rape, crimes against humanity, or genocide? The answer is as depressing as obvious. No, it didn't. Neither did all the various theaters in Paris stop Robespierre's regime de terreur, nor did Wagner's music hold up the Second World War, nor did any poem of Hölderlin avert the Shoah. And after every coup d'etat that shook decolonized Burundi, and which was accompanied by massacres against the civil society, the radio station played the most beautiful European classical music, like Schubert's Piano Sonata 21 or Chopin's Bolero in C major. We actually know very well that we do not learn peace from beauty and that aesthetic contemplation did not necessarily negate destructive tendencies, neither in our personality nor in our society. What culture can achieve, though, is a deeper understanding of the contradictory essence of us, the human beings. Let it be rational or emotional, fear-driven or curious, marked by the past, tempted by the future, or all at once. What culture can achieve is a deeper understanding of ourselves and the people around us, may they be close or distant, and that can hardly be overestimated. If we only look at Europe, we already have such different national or even regional histories that are all deeply intertwined, but at the same time give to their citizens such different experiences of life, authority, politics, social trust and mistrust, 
compulsion and freedom, that we may talk about the same day, but think in different calendars. Not only was Europe split into a Soviet-orientated and a trans transatlantic-orientated side, you also have to remember that Spain and Portugal were ruled by conservative and fascist dictatorships until the 1970s, while Greek citizens suffered from several military coup d'etat and the conflicts on the Balkan found its terrible peak with the genocide of Srebrenica in the mid-1990s that brought back a horror to Europe that many had naively thought was overcome, at least here, in this part of this world. But what does this here mean? It means, or at least assumes, a still existing belief in a latent moral superiority of Europe, which is not less than cynical with regard to the, to the destructive past of this continent and its expanding claim to power. It means, or at least suggests, that a genocide in other parts of the world might be seen not as shocking as it is here. Some may even think of it as part of a normality, like the French, the, the ex, uh, the French ex-president François Mitterrand, who is said to have commented the Rwandan genocide with the words, in these countries, a genocide is not very important. What this here does not mean, though, is that culture was missing. But it means that the peaceful Europe of the post-war period that is evoked so often to exist only within tight temporal and spatial limits. It means that we apparently prefer to entertain the illusion of an idol that we project into the past than to face the more demanding challenge to reflect the complex contradictions of the present, aiming a cautious, unideological, and deliberated utopia that is not a rigorous empire of good, but leaves space for the sometimes painful ambivalences that belong to human life. For this challenge, I see culture as a significant, if not decisive, means because it opens the space to what we may be and brings into dialogue the historically grown and sometimes inconsistent layers of our community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you put some salt on the European wounds, right? That is especially your subject, especially if you're a demanded, uh, let's say, interview partner. But as an author, you mostly write about African politics in the second half of the 20th century, especially Burundi and Rwanda, and also Antonio Gramsci. How is, is that, let's say, uh, a contradiction, or is it needed to explain our, let's say, future? What's your interest in that, let's say, tension? The tension uh, between Europe and, for example, the, like the, the countries that have been yeah. colonized by Germans. Occupied. Occupied. Drained out. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just, I mean, I'm, I'm, I imagine myself as a German writer because I was raised here. Uh, so I'm interested in the history um, uh, that my heritage is. And... I think that, or it, it surprises me uh, that when I went to school, colonialism was something the British did. Maybe the French, but maybe the Belgians, but I think we didn't get that. But uh, You've been on the same school then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably. <laughs> um, but Germany was, uh, I mean, there's an obvious thing why uh, Germany's why, why we don't talk so much about the colonialism in Germany, because uh, Germany achieved to produce the, the biggest and darkest catastrophe uh, humanity ever witnessed. So we have this in, in our past, and, but everything that was before actually vanished. And like with the, Versailles, the Treaty of Versailles, we not only lost the, our colonies, 
but also the memory of it. And I think that's kind of very, very strange. I, if I understood you correctly, that is not so much the work of an author. Uh, that is more the part of, uh, let's say, uh, a journalist to work that out. Or you think uh, that literature can, let's say, uh, take away that burden or explain what our heritage is in an appropriate way. Is that possible? I think that that is uh, the work of an author. What I don't really like uh, to, to read by authors in their novels, in their poetry and so on, is like a ideological um, education. That's what I don't like with social realism, that I don't like with, with other um, uh, ideas. But uh, to get into the deep, uh, the deepness uh, of, the, of the past and of our personality that consists of our heritage and, and of the blind spots that we don't want to see. That's, uh, for that, a novel is wonderful. The Never Ending Project of Enlightenment. Thank you very much. Well, <laughs> Nora Bosson. Last but not least, Daniel Kielmann. I think he knows that he's one of the most read German authors after World War II. Yes, he does. German-Austrian origin, he knows as well. He's a world citizen. Yeah, traveled just recently. When did you come, actually? When did you fly in? Uh, you mean fly in, fly into Berlin? I yeah, mean, fly in. You mean from, from the United States? Mm -hmm. Because I was, I've just been to Austria on Sunday, so I don't think that's what you're asking about. So from oh, no. the United States, uh, early June. <laughs> ah, so you're on the road already, okay. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you've been 14 days in Austria? <laughs> Uh, in Austria, no, no. Actually, this is this is going to be in my statement. The question of quarantine, but they're not we're, they're not quarantining people when they come from Austria. Austria is currently not a risk region. That might change tomorrow. Yeah, so no, no. This is what you know as a world citizen, where you have to stay longer involuntarily. Well, by the way, he's a real magician, as I wrote, uh, I read, obviously a sorcerer, but he's not going to play any tricks. Trust me, he has won some prizes just by literature, not by magic. Thank you, Daniel Kilman. Two weeks ago, I took an EasyJet flight from Vienna to Berlin. Uh, once we had touched down, we were ordered to deplane, row by row, slowly and carefully. We all kept the required distance. Then the crew on the ground ordered us to cram into one small bus, which took us to the terminal. Nothing is as universal as a virus. The virus turns out to be the great equalizer. There are no borders for a virus, just vulnerable human bodies. And what did Europe do? It reverted to total regionalism. During just one flight, different rules governed our behavior in the plane and on the ground. Those of the air airline versus those of the airport. One set of rules versus another set of rules. The airport is playing out in small what is playing out at society at large. We are back to renationalizing our lives. One country's rules vastly different from its neighbors. The, United, the European Union just disappeared. Instead, we compare infection numbers, country to country, as if we are in a bizarre World Cup. Our media is treating this new sport, comparing COVID numbers, as a welcome spectacle. Not a day passes without someone publicly pondering questions like, did Denmark handle the virus better than France or did Ireland do worse than Norway? Did the government of Italy implement more effective measures than Spain or is it the other way around? Who's winning? The big takeaway of the pandemic could be that all borders are a fiction which we should work to overcome, but that was not the path we chose. Instead, everyone fortified their national borders. Can anyone still keep track of which country is currently considered a risk area by which other country? Where are you allowed to travel to from where and where can you not travel anymore because the government suspended all flights from this or that other country? The rules are changing daily and often are not even stated in writing. You just have to feel them or better just don't and stay home. It's true, we all used to travel too much. Those millions of business meetings conducted every day were likely not necessary, nor did we have 
to take a cheap flight to a holiday spot every weekend. But what we are experiencing now seems like a strange trip back to the 50s. Once again, we don't know what exactly is happening in foreign lands. What is the situation in Mexico? Are the hospitals there overwhelmed or not? What exactly is happening in Iran, in Kosovo? How come we are not hearing anything about Venezuela anymore, whose collapsed financial system we read about on a daily basis before the pandemic started? We don't know because nobody's traveling, and most media correspondents have been recalled to their home countries. But don't worry about the world. Our governments are exhorting, just rediscover the beauty of your homeland. Why would you want to go to Toledo, where everyone is infected anyway, when you can stay safe and happy in the Bavarian Alps? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no doubt, strict travel restrictions can help limit the spread of infections. But then why stop at country borders and not cut off regions? or sanction leaving your town, or city borough, or village, or street. Until just a few months ago, we were debating an ever closer union, a United States of Europe even, and in a parallel universe, the EU would have risen to the challenge of the pandemic and issued common rules and recommendations valid from Palermo to Tallinn. But in our infinitely sadder reality, we are comparing German numbers to the numbers of Austria and Switzerland and are proud of our government when our numbers turn out better than theirs for this week. And that is why we need culture. Literature, theater, art, music all remind us that there is a world out there, that it just won't do to retreat to our villages. We need a united Europe now more than ever. We need a European Union as a lived and living ideal, not a permanent competition between national departments of health. We need musicians, writers and artists who are in touch with musicians, writers and artists of other countries to remind us that the world outside our borders it is not just a confusing patchwork of risk areas full of infected people. Humans are not only existing in the natural world, we are also citizens of the realm of freedom. And in that realm, ideas can be more contagious than viruses. That is why, of course, our governments have to rally in support of culture, uh, crucially through public funding. But we also have to start traveling again, even if it strikes us as dangerous and inconvenient, even though we may like our new reality of living in a 50s time capsule. An English novelist friend just told me on the phone, everyone is home, nobody's going anywhere and they all love it. Isn't it awful? Yes, just staying at home is a beautiful and idyllic ideal that we can truly enjoy. It's an ideal that we have to resist. Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, I see some anger has been collected in the run of the last few weeks, <laughs> especially being a New Yorker trying to get out to the coast and being appreciated and welcome. Oh, you were there, you're bringing the virus. That's what you at least been telling. Uh, on the Austrian television. La let's be serious for one second because we don't have so much time anymore. Uh, you actually signed a, a contract, uh, an open letter, in which you said, well, stop that cancelling policy, which is a big difference in the United States and in Germany because we are not, let's say, at least two years behind. Um, why did you sign that um, open letter, why do you say we have to stop not only staying at home, but also stopping discussions? I mean, the Harper's letter, as it's called now, uh, it's really a letter that's very relevant for the situation right now in the United States. And I signed that as someone at that moment who was living in New York. And I do think the situation in Europe, and for example, especially in Germany, in regard to all these phenomena we're talking about is very different from... And, and I think what this letter was talking about was mostly a really uh, concerning tendency in, well, let's say in the, in, in the human resources department of certain corporations. 
uh, among them, for example, the New York Times or some, also some universities who suddenly tended to fire people just because they were attacked ferociously on, uh, on Twitter. They were firing, started to firing people who were attacked on Twitter. And uh, I think that that was the quite actually the, the, the thing this letter was uh, addressing was much more narrow than uh, in, in then some people who were commenting on it in different countries or in, in Europe thought about. It was really about this uh, tendency to fire people who, had, who were um, employees of corporations. It was not about any idea that uh, free speech is under threat from the left. I don't think that's true in, a, in, in this generalist way. Well, you showed in a very nice and convincing way that humor is a good, let's say, tool to point out various things. Humor, I'm sometimes smithing while I'm listening to vi vi virologists and epidemiologists and politicians. So that is obviously an op a contribution you want to share. But do you have the feeling that you can s just say change politics by writing text or you have to use your power as an author to appear in public and not speaking as an author? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, writers have certainly done that. They have changed things by uh, appearing in public. Um, well, I think works of literature, works of art, they change things in a very slow-burning, uh, invisible way. There is no quick change brought about by any work of art. But in the long run, I mean, novels are and have always been a school of empathy. You learn to think, and that's something that television can't do, that even that movies can't do, that only a novel can do. It can put you in the mind of someone else in a very, very direct, profound way. You can think as someone else. And um, you, can, you, you, you cannot read a lot of good novels and not become a person who's a little bit more tolerant because of that. And so I think that's, a, that's certainly something that brings about some change. Yeah. Do we have a time for one last round or do, uh, yeah, five minutes, five more minutes? 15 minutes. So everybody has to be out there in 30 seconds, but no rush. Is, did I get that right? All right. Okay. Okay. Basic here. Yeah. Where should we start? I mean, is the pandemic a topic we're going to speak uh, about in a year starting here? Is it going to change your role as an author? Is it going to change our societies to a degree where we say where well, it has changed dramatically and not for the better, or even for the better. What do you think? Well, I mean, one thing, one tendency we can see very clearly is that the state has become all-powerful, uh, sometimes in very useful ways. Um, I mean, I think a state assuming a bigger role in countries like Britain, for instance, is welcome to a certain extent because the state has privatized so much, so many things that only the state can do well and now it's rediscovering some of its duties. Well, that's good. Um, at the same time, the state in places like Hong Kong, uh, China, India, has used the pandemic to become even more authoritarian and repressive. So there are various you know, different tendencies at work. I don't really think at this point there's a kind of you know, clear sense of the, where we are headed. Uh, what the future will be. I mean, it will certainly be very, very difficult for many, many people who've lost their jobs. Mm. Um, but, you know, I th and I think as writers too, we have to worry about the future of reading, books, so many different things have been brought into question by yeah. this. Uh, Senor Vargas Llosa, you come from Peru, which has, after all, uh, after all this testing, we have the highest number of people among 100,000. They have like 88 cases. Uh, is there something that has gone particularly wrong in the country you're coming from, or is it for reasons I cannot distinguish now? Uh, my, what you the micro? Did you get? Did you get acoustically my question? Okay. okay. What went wrong in Peru? If you're looking at the COVID, can you use the microphone, please? The mic Sorry. Um, you. Do, do, did, did you ask if something is wrong in Peru? Yes. Many things. <laughs> many, many things, yes. Since the beginning of uh, our history. Us, I would say, in most Let's make countries, it short. You know? uh, 
uh, it is an underdeveloped uh, country, which means that there are a minority of people which are very wealthy, uh, and there are many, many Peruvians who are very poor, and the gap between prosperity and poverty is really enormous, as it is uh, the case on all Latin American, Latin American countries. Um, has been improving the, the, the country, yes. It has improved, uh, but very slowly, but uh, with periods very bad, with brutal dictatorships, and democratic periods too. Um, and probably in the democratic periods, uh, the progress, the advances have been much more uh, serious than during the dictatorships. Uh, corruption, the, the, the main problem in Peru is corruption, yeah. political corruption, which is really enormous. And probably this is the major problem of democratic countries in Latin America, corruption, you know? Mm. Well, looking at our democratic countries here, there's a question for both of you. Uh, well, we had the discussions against the corona politics. Is that a subject you feel like demanded to, let's say, work on if you look at the demonstrations or you think that, well, that's a typical German problem. I mean, that's not a major thing. We've, put, we've been putting too much energy into this demonstration. I mean, you feel our system in danger in a certain way because we had that run on the Reichstag, uh, on the stairs of the Reichstag. That's a big difference. Or is that something which, uh, well, you have a microscope view there and you, let's say, you make it bigger than it actually is as a problem. I honestly, I'm completely confused about the whole, everything to do with Corona and COVID-19, uh, the way that it has been <clears throat> reported on, the way that the government has handled it, um, right you, at the beginning of the hour. Our or the uh, The German government. The German, okay. I'm not gonna even comment on the British government. <laughs> I am so, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm very, very disappointed in, in the way that it's been handled in the UK. but. I was really impressed with how um, it was handled in Germany. At the beginning of March, I felt like um, I had trust in, in what was happening. And then all of a sudden, things were changing. And now we have a situation where there's a kind of a relaxation of the rules. And I haven't really, un I, I, I feel like I'm missing information. What changed from the situation at the beginning of March to now? Why is it suddenly different? Mm. It's completely confused me. It's completely confused me. Um, why there's so much um, fury or why there's this uh, very odd uh, unity of s such disparate groups marching down the streets in unity um, against the government. And I also think that when I think about it really carefully, um, there are many, many people who have still been uh, um, abandoned by, by the system. So that, that some people have received support. I was one of the artists that was lucky enough to receive a sum of money uh, from Berlin as a, a freelance artist. But I had a, a Steuer, no, my tax number. I had, you know, I was registered here. I had all the paperwork to prove that I had been paying my taxes in the past. So it was very easy for me to apply. But somebody who didn't have um, this kind of security, maybe recently arrived in, in, in Germany or something, they were completely left on their own and had to rely on charity handouts. So for me, the whole thing is very, very confusing. Mm. Uh, well, confusing or terrifying, what do you say? I mean, are we in a confusing situation these days? I mean, of course, in terms nobody is a virologist, as I said, we can just only laugh about certain things. But how do you perceive the situation? Are we in a certain way? Is democracy at stake? Uh, well, democracy is always in danger because uh, if we don't support democracy and uh, that's not just a thing that the government does and we go to vote every four years, but democracy means that there is a vivid civil society and democracy can always die because no one is interested in it. Uh, or is just angry because uh, whatever, the taxes are too high or too low or whatever. So I think at the moment we just have a confusing situation that we did not expect, of course. Uh, we have a government that handles it more or less okay, I would say. Um, 
And um, of course we have like uh, right-wing extremists who wait for a crisis to have their revolution, their right-wing revolution. I don't think, and of course I don't hope that will, they will be successful, but if you, if you read right-wing uh, thinkers, that's what they already publish. They wait for a crisis like that, let it be an economical crisis that will follow uh, after the yeah. medical uh, crisis. So, well, I think, yeah. Daniel Kilmer is taking that very calmly because he's traveling and coming back and forth from a country where there are, let's say, uh, a few months ahead in terms of uh, anger and fury. Okay. Uh, are you going to back to be at the United States when the elections are taking place to have like another full story you can write? Uh, no, uh, that, that would be interesting, of course, but no, we, we, we are not going back the next, uh, at least the next school year, we're going to stay here. My son is going to a German school and it's great for him. And we've, we planned that before the pandemic, so we didn't run away because of COVID. That was planned before. So uh, we are, we, we, we're going to stay for a little while and then we'll see. I'm not going to be back. I can't even go back for the election because uh, I'm on a visa and they canceled, I mean, they didn't cancel the visa, but you can't come in if you're on a visa. So um, I, I, I can't, but I, if I could... Are you I worried? So are you worried about Germany? Are you worried about the United States? Or just like I'm not too worried about Germany. It was, a, of course, it was very ugly when those few lunatics were running up the Reichstag stairs, but they, 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 were, they didn't really have a chance to <laughs> take, take power and rule the country. That wasn't something that could actually happen. I'm of course worried about the United States and uh, I do think right now it looks like the monster will lose uh, the election but on the other hand it's very um, frightening to think what's going to happen if the monster doesn't lose the election and I was I was actually thinking uh, a lot about um, about the, 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 the future of the United States in terms of, uh, of, of some of the books that Mario Vargas Llosa wrote about uh, about dictatorship in South uh, America, especially the, the, the book you wrote, the, the, the last the book you published a few, uh, like two or three years ago, uh, set in the late Fuji, Fujimori years. And, uh, and, and, and I was thinking if Trump stays in power long, the United States are not going to have a situation like, the Ger like Germany in the 30s. It's going to be like a South American country ruled by corruption and permanent upheaval without any real ideology. So that, that, that or, or like a philosopher friend of me said, if, if Trump wins, we're going to get North Brazil uh, instead of the United States. So I, 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 I would be interested, do you agree with that, that that would be the f threatening future of the United States, like a non-ideological um, permanent upheaval situation? It's fantastic that you open the discussion once we have to get out. I love that. That's <laughs> I felt like I was so curious <laughs> about that. That's <laughs> an unfinished text, yeah. Are we going to have in the United States a situation like, and you said, compare it to Brazil, uh, is that in danger if you look at the United States? Uh, well, I've been very de depressed with what uh, uh, Mr. Trump is doing in, in, uh, in America. I think he's de destroying things that, are, that were extremely important in, in, in America. Uh, the rule of law, for example. It used to be very strong. It's not uh, uh, strong anymore. And uh, the, the idea of the president that has changed dramatically with Trump. Um, the president was a person who didn't lie in the past. That was this idea, you know? And with Trump, we have discovered that a president could lie every day. He's been lying and lying systematically, um, using power uh, in such a way that uh, was such a distortion of the tradition of, of, of America that uh, United States is becoming an, 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 an underdeveloped country in, in this sense, you know? Um, and the way in which he wants to remain in, 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 in power 
uh, using all kind of uh, uh, tricks uh, to permit, you know, this uh, ethanization of him in, in, in power, I think has been destroying things that were uh, essential in, 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 in America. Um, so, I hope very much that he will lose this election um, in order for, for America to recover uh, something that has been lost during these four years. I'm just thinking, yes, get the applause. So you've seen all, culture is the backbone of our democracy and you see all the nerves and spines gone up there and all the different areas which the bulb flows. So it's a large variety. There's sense of humor. There's a strong power of distinction. There's intellectual force. There's so much empathy. So that was very convincing. Thank you, Sharon the Duo Otu. Thank you, Norba Song, Daniel Kielman, Pankaj Mishra, and Mario Vargas Yosa for coming and joining us.